Hi, well, thank, first of all, thanks so much for, for, for having me, for inviting me today to talk about a data visualization, uh, the, the professional field I have devoted my, my, my entire professional life. What I would like to discuss with you today is what I call, um, I think that the rules or the principles that we should all follow to become good data citizens or good data visualization citizens. In the past few years, I have been interested in how to make how we can develop a reasoning process to uh, make good choices whenever we design a visualization. And all of you are going to uh, are going to become the visualization designers. So it is good that you start developing also some thinking process, some reasoning process that may lead you to make good choices when designing when designing graphics. In any case, before I get started, I would like to give credit to the author of a, the images that you will see on the opening a slice of this slide deck. The, those illustrations come from my project created by Nadi Bremer, who's a famous visualization uh, designer with the help of, a, of an illustrator called Juliana Chen. This project is titled Why Do Cats and Dogs? And if you enjoy creative, uh, interactive data visualization with an artistic edge, I would really, really recommend that you visit these, uh, that you visit this project. It's a lot of fun. It contains uh, tons of data. It's based on Google data. The whole idea behind this project is um, what, what do we search for? What do people search for in Google when people search for why is my dog doing or why is my cat doing what types of searches people make? And many of them will surprise you. The project is very, very cute and it contains tons of little animations and illustrations. It's a lot of fun. And I had the opportunity to art direct it uh, uh, before it was published. So I, I had a lot of fun collaborating with Nadine. So in any case, that's to give credit. Let's get started. So one of the things that you need to get that you need to become aware of is that if you are interested in, in in visualization in the visual representation of information or I, I would say in information design in general which is about shaping information to enable understanding and in more in particular if you're interested in the branch of information design called data visualization the visual representation of numbers and of quantities you're entering a field that is going through a golden age a golden age that began uh, i would say around the 60s or the 70s of the of the 20th century uh, since then in the past 40 50 years there has been an explosion in the use of a of data visualization particularly in the in the past decade or decade and a half right, thanks to the rise of the internet and digital technologies and the increasing availability of data and also of free tools to visualize to analyze and visualize their, their data that creates a huge opportunity for anyone who wants to become a professional visualization designer in fields for example such as business analytics the the field of analytics is, is exploding uh, in pair pair with it with the field of data science and both fields use visualization on a regular basis to display for example the performance of companies or for companies to analyze their own uh, data. But this, um, this is not the only field in which visualization is taking over or expanding very rapidly. Down here at the University of Miami, as you know, I am a professor at the University of Miami teaching visualization. I collaborate with plenty of fields, with plenty of departments all over the university that are using more and more visualization techniques to communicate, to analyze data, but also to communicate that data. Our Department of Marine and Environmental Sciences, for example, that does a lot of work about climate change, uh, biology, physics, mathematics, statistics, visualization is becoming uh, sort of like universal, a universal language. And if there is something that I would like to do today through this talk is to get you excited about the possibilities of visualization and to encourage you to follow it as a, as a passion, but also as a, as a profession. Now, this golden age of data visualization can also be witnessed, can also be seen in the field that I come from. As you know, I am a journalist by training. For many years, I directed uh, departments of visualization in media organizations in Spain and also in, in Brazil, later in the United States as a consultant. In the field of journalism, visualization is also uh, increasing in terms of use very, very rapidly everywhere in all countries that I'm aware of. Just to give you a factoid that I think that is quite revealing, last year, the Washington Post published a story discussing the most viewed stories 
that they have ever published, the Washington Post Online, the famous new paper, newspaper in the US. And they disclosed that out of the seven most viewed stories ever published by the Washington Post Online, six of them were stories that were developed by the graphics department, by the visualization department in the, in the Washington Post. Six out of seven. That's highly impressive. And it really shows you know, the many opportunities that we have as visualization designers, as visualization creators, to have a positive impact in the world. Because our work attracts attention, attracts the attention of, of people, he has the potential to uh, expand people's uh, horizons, capture their imagination, persuade people, inform people as well. So in that sense, visualization, and this is one of the core ideas behind this uh, short talk, visualization is not just about designing beautiful things. It is also about designing useful things. And that is, should be paired, I think, with some sort of ethos, some sort of ethical thinking that will lead us to uh, provide, to create good data visualizations. Another example, by the way, of the popularity of data visualization, probably many of you have seen this graphic that captured the imagination of so many people from all over the world. Uh, a, a strip graphic, a, a heat map, we could call it, that through the intensity of red and blue represents the average temperature of the world from the past to the present. The present is the redder, the redder area. So it, it represents, it's a graphic that represents climate change in a very uh, sort of a compelling, very persuasive, very convincing, and also highly uh, attractive manner. This graphic has been reproduced by the economists on the cover of the economists. Some people have printed it out to post it in their cars. People carried in demonstrations, right, to protest uh, against governments that don't take action again against climate change. So as, as I was saying before, visualization is really, really powerful visual because it's so persuasive, so informative, so useful. But the fact that it is so powerful also involves, or there is a, something that we should derive from the fact that it's so powerful, which is that by having that power, we also have a huge responsibility, right? In terms of getting things right, in terms of presenting the information in a correct manner. And that is the core of the presentation, of this short presentation that I'm, I'm, I'm giving you today, which is to encourage you to start thinking in visualization, not in terms of rules that are set in stone, but in terms of reasoning. One of the core, I think, one of the core changes that we need, that we are going to face in the next few years in visualization is to stop thinking in the terms that were described in older books in the literature of, of visualization, including some of my own writings that are too much, too focused on give, telling people what to do, right? Do this, don't do that, right? Use this type of graphic, don't use this other type of graphic. Trying to come up all right, in a, with a set of rules that everybody could follow. Like if you could design visualizations as using a, a cookie cutter, like if you could use templates to design data visualizations. More and more, I have grown convinced that visualization needs to be analyzed and it needs to be understood in a similar way that we analyze or understand writing. So certainly, if you want to write well, you need to respect grammar. You need to follow grammar. You need to use the symbols of the language that you used to that, that you used to write. But those are the only things that you need to follow. After that, after you use grammar well and you use the symbols of your language correctly, the way that you write will vary a lot. And it will vary depending on multiple circumstances. It will vary depending on the content that you're trying to convey. It will vary depending on the audience you are presenting the, the information related to your writing too. It will depend on the nature of the stories that you want to tell. It will depend on it will depend on your own aesthetic preferences in some in some cases. So visualization is quite similar. Visualization is should be based, I think, not on following rules that are set in stone, but trying to follow some sort of like reasoning process in which we provide ourselves and other people, the people who are going to consume our visualizations, these justified choices. We should be able to reason our decisions. For everything that you do in a visualization, you should have, you need to have a good reason why you are doing that 
in that particular way. And that reason needs to be based either on evidence, on empirical evidence, for instance, about related to what we know about how the human brain processes information, but it can be based on many, many, many other, many other factors. And we are going to discover them, uh, take, take a look at them in just one minute. Before I proceed, by the way, one thing that I must say is that the slides that you're seeing, the slides that I'm, that I'm using in this presentation, you will all have access to them, so you will be able to download them, so you will be able to click on any project that I show here today. And also, at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the presentation, at the end of the slide deck, I have included several resources that I, that I give to my own students at the university every year, some reading, some extra resources that I think that expand on the contents of the of the presentation today. 